In this video, you'll learn about visualization, which is a technique that uses your mind to help you achieve what you want. It means creating clear pictures in your mind of yourself achieving your goals. By doing this, you train your subconscious mind to work towards making those goals come true. Be clear about what you want, clearly define your goals, and visualize them with as much detail as you possibly can. First of all, we have to distinguish between modulators and mediators, and I'll do this very briefly. There are a lot of things that will modulate your state of focus, but they don't directly mediate your sense of focus. So for instance, if right now a fire alarm went off in this building, it would modulate our attention. We would get up and leave. It would be very hard to do what we're doing with that banging in the background, at least at first. So it's modulating focus, but it's not really involved in the mechanisms of focus, right? Imagine the sights, the sounds, the emotions associated with accomplishing your goals. This kind of clarity will provide a blueprint for your mind to follow. Consistency is key. Practice visualization regularly to strengthen its effectiveness. Make it a habit daily and immerse yourself in the experience. There's something important about that relationship between vision and time perception. At some point in human evolution, whether or not it was through the visual system or whether or not it was through the prefrontal cortical mechanisms, something very special happened for old world primates and us in particular, which is, the thing that I really believe sets us apart from all the other animals, the reasons that we are the curators of the earth and not other species is twofold. One, the duration of time in our lifespan in which we can engage in neuroplasticity, the ability to deliberately change our neural architecture through learning. Mm. And the other one is time perception. At some point, we developed the ability to divorce from memories of the past and experiences in the present and also anticipate experiences in the future. And I don't know because I'm not in the elk's mind or the mind of a turtle, but everything that we know about their sensory life and perception says that, sure, they have memories. This whole notion of a goldfish not having a memory, that's, that's like the stupidest thing I ever heard. First of all, the experiment's never been done. And second of all, like, like why would, the goldfish has to swim in circles? Who, who decided it forgot? I think that's a myth. So, but they can remember food is over there. Animals cache food for the winter and go back to those cache sites. It, it you know, squirrels, incredible memory of location and landmarks and all this stuff. We do that. We have a memory of past. We have perception of present, but we also can think about how past and present relate to anticipate of future events. And that places us in an incredible uh, arena of interaction with the natural world where we can make plans. As you visualize, feel the positive emotions associated with achieving your goals, such as excitement and joy. This emotional connection will further reinforce your subconscious mind. Yeah, I think we're dealing with two general categories of people who have problems with motivation and focus. And I think we've failed to decide, um, excuse me, I think we've failed to describe the fact that there are two groups and not one. We think, well, I need to calm myself enough to move forward. I think, and then other people say, well, no, you need to kind of ramp yourself up to move forward. Here's the way I conceptualize it based on the data that I'm aware of. Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the lines of like Tumo type breathing. So rapid, and we look at this in the lab, we're actually running a human study on this now. So 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. That's what you're doing yeah, when you're doing some that. Some version of the Wim Hof yeah, technique. Or that's what, what that is. Brian McKenzie talks about. Right. It means yoga sleep. You just lie down, you listen to one of these scripts. They're available on YouTube as free, you know, totally cost free. Um, they tend to walk you through a, uh, a set of visualizations and a set of, of breathing protocols that essentially turn the mind off, right? This is the, uh, it, it essentially accomplishes what a couple stiff alcoholic drinks will do, which will also turn off your forebrain. The problem is it has other issues that go with it. And many people who use alcohol to try and calm down have a rebound increase in anxiety. I can always spot anxious people and people that have chronic anxiety by the way that they drink and the way that they need a drink. Anyone tells me I need a drink, I, I know they have a, they're not good at regulating their nervous system.
I'm not using, I'm not uh, saying that in a disparaging way, but it says to me, it's somebody that it's sort of like saying, I need a, I need an Uber driver. I'm like, you don't really know how to drive, you know, or like it's, 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 uh, you know, if you need one, right? right. If you need a chauffeur, right. It's nice to have one sometimes. Sure. Right. But if you need one, there's a problem, right? So yoga nidra is a, is a wonderful practice. Um, the other thing that's wonderful and that now there's a lot of good data on is hypnosis. So one of the things I've become increasingly interested in is hypnosis because I have a collaborator um, by the name of uh, David Spiegel. He's an MD, MD, PhD. He's a, our associate chair of psychiatry at Stanford. And he's used hypnosis uh, to great effect for smoking cessation, pain management, breast cancer outcomes are greatly improved by the sorts of hypnosis he's done with his patients and for sleep and other things. And there's a wonderful resource that I'm happy to point people to. It's a free resource. I think that, you know, a lot these days is being made of epigenetic effects and things, but this is almost in the different direction. This is a psychophysiological response. Uh, I find this kind of thing, to be honest, among the more fascinating and interesting aspects of neuroscience, if not the most interesting lately, um, those examples are tremendous. So I, I can't uh, counter those at all with anything more spectacular. But the, the work of Dr. Uh, Aliyah Crum at Stanford, she runs the Stanford Mind Body Lab, and she's done simple experiments, but they're really elegant, um, instructing people, one group, all about the terrible effects of stress. What destroys your immune system, et cetera, et cetera. Other people, telling them also true things, but all the positive effects of stress. It sharpens your ability of function. You can remember things better, et cetera, et cetera. You see exactly what you are told, basically. Now, you can't lie to people. You can't tell them things that aren't true. It's just about the subset of information that you get dictates the response you get. And perhaps the most dramatic was they gave two different groups of people, and then they actually each got the opposite condition too, a milkshake. One group is told this milkshake is very high calorie. It contains a lot of fat and sugar, et cetera. Another group is told uh, the milkshake they're getting is very low calorie. It's very nutrient sparse, et cetera. Then they measure hunger. So how long it takes for them to get hungry again after ingesting it. They also look at insulin and they also look at ghrelin, this hormone that is secreted um, as you get, essentially makes you hungry. It's associated with hunger. There are other things too, but you see exactly what you would expect, which is that people that get the nutrient dense milkshake are satisfied for longer. Their ghrelin is suppressed and their insulin is higher. And you see the opposite in the group that had the, the so-called low calorie shake. Turns out it's the exact same milkshake. This is remarkable, right? Because this is not simply the placebo effect. I think it's the placebo effect plus the expectation effect plus a real physiological effect because that's what you describe as well. And the way that Ali, Dr. Ali Crum, as she she goes by the way she describes it is that any event causes a real physiological response but that real physiological response is braided in with our expectation and our understanding of what the response ought to be to create the actual response so it's sort of real plus perceived equals Actualized. your reality yes. right exactly and so um i love this kind of thing as you can tell i'm i'm eating up the example that uh that you gave i think it's spectacular because what it means is that, no, we can't lie to ourselves. We can't tell ourselves that, you know, drinking water is going to sustain us just as food would for, uh, for five days. We're not going to be hungry. But to some extent, if one understands that, well, you can survive a long time on just water yeah. and you don't need to eat, then you might experience less hunger. That's the way the nervous system works.